Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everybody. Before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to let all the listeners of this show know about a book that I had recently published a few years ago and is now available again that may be helpful to some of this audience and some other people you know. The book is called Now I Know, Kids Talking to Kids About Divorce. It's a unique children's book narrated entirely from the perspective of kids, focusing on how kids feel when their parents get divorced and providing guidance for the parents as well. Now I Know is a self-contained educational and emotional resource for children, families, caregivers, therapists, and educators alike. I've worked with so many families dealing with divorce and learned so much from the kids themselves who I worked with who told me about what they needed during that time and how they were feeling. And they also wanted to know if other kids felt the same. So I thought I should put together a book where they get to hear how it's okay to feel so many different things, but I also wanted to give them a sense of empowerment, that they could a year from then be able to be the experts on their own experience and talk about what was helpful during the first year after the divorce and also what they wish their parents had known or had done differently. And so it's an educational tool for the whole family. And also there's an opportunity for parents to express to their kids what they're wishing for them and what they vow to try to do differently or vow to try to keep doing that was so helpful. I thought this book could be of interest to some of our listeners because throughout my years of working with people who have been in cults or in controlling and abusive relationships, I've noticed a high percentage of divorce in these situations. The problem not only is that it is a high percentage, but that within cultic systems and also sometimes abusive relationships, feelings have not been allowed. They've not been expressed. Sometimes they haven't been taught. Sometimes people just don't have the words for them. So kids might not know how to say how they're feeling or even know that it's okay to be having the feelings that they're having. And also sometimes parents are not able to be guided about how to be parents in these moments, in these moments of transition. And this gives them an opportunity to hear from children about what would be helpful and what would even be necessary for them during this time. Some parents also tell me that while they knew how to be parents, they weren't allowed to when they were in that group or in that relationship. They were constrained by the environment or the person controlling them, and they now feel free having left and being able to be disengaged from their controller to be able to be the parent they want to be. And they want a refresher. They want a guide. So this book is an opportunity. It's a place where you can read, where you can learn, where you can journal. It's a guide. It's a time of reflection. And it's a way for parents and children to communicate with each other during this time of transition. And it's a book for all families. The parents on purpose are not gendered in the book. So it really is all inclusive. Check it out. And we'll make sure to give you a link so that you can see it for yourself and buy it if you think it would be helpful for you or if it would be helpful for someone you know. Today on the show, I'm very happy to have John Sawyer. John was raised in two homes, influenced by both high-demand religion and secular worldviews. Prior to his parents' divorce at the age of four, His family was involved with both Transcendental Meditation and Christian Science. Shortly after his parents' divorce, his mother took a secular route while his father converted to Pentecostal and Charismatic Christianity. Quite a change. While John's father sprinkled elements of Transcendental Meditation and Christian Science into his childhood, his dad's newfound evangelical Christian faith fixated on the end of the world, divine healing, speaking in tongues, and the quote-unquote prosperity gospel. When John was 15, 
he himself decided to convert to Mormonism. From the age of 15 to 35, John was involved with various high-demand religious groups that were associated with both charismatic Christianity and Mormonism, and as a teen who was deeply conflicted about his attraction to the same sex, John attended the now-defunct Spirit Life Bible College associated with Roberts Learden Ministries in Orange County, California. While at Spirit Life Bible College, John experienced multiple sessions of exorcism and conversion therapies that were aimed at healing, quote-unquote, his sexual identity. When John was 26, he became involved with Sovereign Grace Churches, a group that began during the Charismatic Jesus Movement in the 1970s and eventually adopted a neo-Calvinistic theology that emphasized strict gender roles and courtship practices. John separated from organized religion six years ago at the age of 35, and since that time, John has benefited from somatic therapy, completed both a BA and MA in education, and is currently a doctoral student and researcher at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Partly due to the influence of his experiences with high-demand religious groups, John now studies the intersection of education policy and anti-discrimination law. Today, you will hear the first part of my two-part conversation. Here's John now. I am so happy to have John Sawyer on the show today. I am really gratified Uh, when people contact me to be able to tell their story. It lets me know that they're at a point or close to a point where they feel that they want people to really know about what they went through, but more than that, really learn from what they went through. So John, if you can take a moment just to introduce yourself and then we'll start talking. Sure. I'll start with what I do, I guess, my day job, which filters into many other parts of my life because my experiences with high demand religions, high control groups really inform what I'm doing now. I am in the doctoral program at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm studying at the intersection of education policy and anti-discrimination law, in particular how private religious institutions uh, are held accountable to our laws and more than often are not held accountable to a laws. And um, so that's my my interest. And it's hard for me to separate my my childhood. It's hard for me to separate the high control groups that I've been involved with from my work, even though I have tried at times and I've just given up on that. I just realized that what I do now is really informed by these experiences and looking at dynamics of control, both through teachings, theology, practice, and the like. So I'm, I'm excited to be here and share about this somewhat complex story, but I think you'll find that there are some similar veins throughout what I share. Right. Okay. Yes. And there usually is, you know, there are these threads. Before we get into the personal, when you just mentioned about the law, I do want to start there if we can, just even for a few moments, talking about the limitations of it. I know, you know, over time, there have been people who have tried to help there be an understanding of what people go through when they're involved in a cult and also when they're taken advantage of and when they're deceived When they're being emotionally, spiritually, psychologically controlled, the attorney, Alan Shefflin, who has been a friend for many years and who had been on the show already probably about two years ago, he has worked a lot within the legal system to reinforce or introduce the idea of undue influence being something, right, that is legally recognized. But still, unless people have evidence unless they can prove, then it's very hard for the law to get involved. And over and over again, the cult leaders, sometimes the perpetrators in these situations are the ones who are more protected by the law than the ones who are victimized by them. So if you can tell us a little bit about that and your frustration with that, but also if you see that there's any progress being made, just teach us about what's happening on that front. Thanks for asking that question. I guess what I'll start is what I have observed through my 
interaction with various groups is that education is often tied into these groups. There are private schools that are run from these organizations. Some of these organizations very much uh, advocate homeschooling and um, outside of the, the traditional public education domain. And as such, there is very little accountability for what goes on within those schools. When you're looking at public education domains, you have educational amendments that are part of the uh, Civil Rights Act, Title IX, and whatnot that offer some measure of protection. And there is some accountability, I guess, theoretically in these private educational domains. But what's really difficult is to find an angle where you can hold groups responsible for example, conversion therapy, therapy in quotes, practices that harm LGBTQ students and high demand religious organizations. There is, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm encouraged in that, in the circles that I'm at in, uh, in work with my advisor at the University of Colorado Boulder, I'm seeing more and more discussion about religion and the law. And um, there are conversations being had about as religious groups become more involved with, you know, the government and they're receiving public funds for these private schools, that that is where there can be some accountability. But right now, it's it's fairly limited. I've looked at where courts might distinguish between sex discrimination and sexual harassment. So currently, there are laws that protect on the grounds of, of sexual harassment. And those are usually based on policies, statutes that have come out of things to do with employment. But when it pertains to sex discrimination, like you're in a private religious school and you separate males from females, that's okay. That's sex discrimination. But, but what, where there are some difficulties is what happens when there is very real harm inflicted on students in these private religious spaces. And that, I think, there is a lot of room to grow. I did hear the episode regarding undue influence, and I was really fascinated by that. And it was another angle to possibly explore. And I bring all that up to, to say that um, in some ways, due to my, my experiences with high control groups, I've been looking for a way to fight back in a healthy way and in a productive way. And so I I explored, well, maybe I go study religious studies or, you know, I'm thinking of all of these ways that I might be able to make sense of what, some of what I went through. And now I'm in a very practical domain and I'm trying to bring some of my experiences to light to influence policymakers and those who are working in and through the law. Because just as you said, there, there is not a lot of protection currently, especially in private religious spaces. And what's so interesting, too, is uh, even within sort of these large group awareness trainings, you know, the, uh, they they have you sign away your rights, basically, from the start. They don't tell you what all these forms are that you're supposed to sign in order to get started with the next step of your life, that you're actually kind of paralyzing your ability to get justice by signing these forms. And so, you know, one of the markers of a group that you need to be wary of is a group that has you sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, right from the start, because the question then becomes, what are they trying to hide and what are they worried about? What I think is also true is that there have been cases where people have taken their call to court and they've lost. Other times they've won, but more often they've lost. And cultic groups have a lot of cash that they spend on attorneys, sometimes attorneys who are not very nice. And I know, and I talked about this on the podcast, but a long time ago, one of the first support groups I ever ran for former cult members, there were two current Scientologists who signed up for the support group. And I was thinking, that's odd. Why are they signing up? And they were very clear to say, we are Scientologists and we are signing up for your support group. And I said, it's a former cult member support group. What is your reason for joining? Well, we used to, one said, I used to be Jewish. And another one said, I used to be Christian. I said, okay, well, I don't know if they're really known as cults. But I said, you know, the fact that you keep telling me you're Scientologist over and over again means something. So what does it mean? And so it came to mean that they wanted to be able to go to the group because they were sure there were people in the support group who had left Scientology and hadn't been open about it yet. So they could then collect that data and report them back to the, the group. 
when I got a sense of that, that they were being overly curious about the people who were there and their backgrounds and what group they were in and finding out private information about them, I told them that they could no longer return. And then they tried to sue me for religious persecution. And that was fascinating, right? Because then if you're a church and someone, so that's why they said we are Scientologists, so that I knew that. So that could then be the reason that I then kicked them out. And so it went nowhere, which is a good thing, but it could have gone farther. And it could have been that, you know, I had to deal with the law in keeping them from getting involved in a support group where they were there really to spy and to harass. (laughs) And I thought, wow, it is so interesting that I don't have rights here necessarily, but they do. It was fascinating. Well, in in the whole notion of religious exemption is something that um, you know, you look at it historically, and I think many scholars would agree was set in place in order to protect religious freedoms, really, right? But then what's happening is the more that, that religious groups are receiving public funds, and many of them are happy to receive that money, um, the more it actually works against them in the long run. And yet they have all of these exemptions. They can claim exemptions on any number of things. There's something called the ministerial exception, again, which has its foundation in, uh, I believe, in employment law. But um, essentially, there are ways that uh, ministers or religious leaders can really get away with a lot of harm that they are inflicting on individuals so long as they can point to the religious teaching and say, my actions line up with my religious conviction. And so if they can do that, our law says that's okay. If there are any listeners out there who are interested in some of what we've talked about, particularly as it pertains to religious schools and the lack of accountability, perhaps stories, those type of things, I would love to talk with you and engage with you because that's the type of of research that drives me and uh, likely will be where I head with my dissertation. Um, So please, I'd I'd love you to reach out to me and I can provide my contact information. Okay, that sounds great. So nice that you are willing and wanting to be a resource in that way. Appreciate that. So now moving back in time. Yeah. So let's get let's get started. Where would you like the story to begin? Yeah, I think it would be good to um, set a framework for the, some of the groups that we'll be talking about. I think the, the two primary groups that have influenced my path that I, I would refer to as high control groups would be charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity. And in my mind, those are synonymous terms. I know there are distinctions in theology and practices and denominations. There are some very similar ideas and things that come out of that charismatic and Pentecostal movement, which I was essentially raised in. And then uh, Mormonism, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I was also involved with. I converted of my own accord at the age of 15, but that didn't stick uh, for a while because I found out some things that caused some pretty strong disillusion at a very young age, which actually then prompted me back into, as I view it, and in my experience, more controlling and more dangerous groups. Those are two of the the major players, if you will. What I do want to say, however, is that I was born in a family in a divorced home. My parents, prior to their divorce, were very much baby boomer spiritual seekers who in the 1970s were exploring all sorts of things, um, got involved with transcendental meditation. My father was a teacher of TM. So I grew up hearing stories about my dad's power to levitate. And then they got involved in Christian science for a time. But then they divorced when I was very young. So I was three or four uh, when they, they divorced. When they divorced, my father then converted to um, charismatic Christianity, uh, was involved in a, a church part of the International Church of the Four Square Gospel, uh, which is associated, uh, was founded by Amy Semple McPherson, a uh, female evangelist in the 20s. That set the stage for my immersion in that world. My mother, however, went on her own journey, and she married a man who is still very dear to me, my stepfather, um, who is an atheist, a very educated man. My parents were college professors. So I grew up in these two worlds between this high control fundamentalism and then this more rational space that were often at odds with each other. And I often experienced 
uh, in my, my young mind and heart, the brunt of those conflicts. Through the course of this episode, instead of, you know, naming all of my parents, I'm just going to refer to my religious parents. And I'm talking about my charismatic Pentecostal parents, which was my dad and stepmother. And then I'll refer to my secular parents, uh, my mother and my stepfather. Even though there are some shades of variation on the secular side, my mom converted to Reformed Judaism at one point, which is a religion. But as it pertains to my experience with high control groups, it's easier for me to categorize them as my religious parents and my secular parents. That's the framework. How interesting when people deal with just having uh, their parents divorce at a young age. I mean, it's a very common thing. So with it being 50% of the population, that is common. What can also happen, though, of course, that compounds the issue is if they go in different directions to the degree where one might be critical of or or opposed to the other in terms of how they believe and potentially worried about their children who are spending time away, right? So that's where the children often get caught in the middle Uh, with these sort of warnings, you know, like when you go spend time with your mother, you have to be careful because this could happen and that could happen because she's not as practicing, et cetera, et cetera. And your mother could also be concerned about your father drumming things into your head. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I feel like you are inside my brain right now, Rachel. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I feel so bad. It's so common and I'm so sorry you had to go through it. So what were the warnings in both directions that you got and that that you had to kind of carry with you from one home to the next? Yeah, and carry with me and the whiplash of going from context to context. You know, I would say on the high control religious parents definitely demonized my secular parents. So I grew up believing that my mother and stepfather were influenced by demonic activity, quite literally. Um, This was not theoretical. This is not something that's just in a book. It was, they are being influenced by demonic entities. They are bound for eternal hellfire. And therefore, the implication is, uh, at least for me, was I need to do something about this and feeling a lot of weight and guilt over the, the state of my secular parents' souls, quite literally. I would say for my when I would I would make the transition from the the religious domain to the secular domain, and it would take me a few days, right? I'd I'd come home, and I even remember my mom commenting and saying, "How come you don't want a hug from me?" You know, and I would I would just freeze up and remember comments about that because I am going back into to to a context where I believe what the stories that are being told to me about demonic activity and their influence of human beings going into those environments and then taking some time to adjust. I would say where the tension came from the secular side was much of what I was experiencing with my religious parents was covert in the sense that I wasn't talking about it much with my, my secular parents, but they they knew that there were things going on, but I wasn't opening up about it. And then when I reached a breaking point uh, in my, my teenage years where it really all came out, that's when the war, at least as I perceive it, started happening. And in my mind at that time, the charismatic Pentecostal religious domain, they were the altruistic good ones. And my secular parents were the bad ones. So that plays into the story. We can talk about that a bit as we, we move on. But I felt very, I don't know, for lack of a better word, persecuted by my secular parents because they didn't get the importance of this spiritual life that I was living and that I was totally committed to and sold out to. So feeling that you were being persecuted by your secular parents says so much about what happens within the psyche, especially when you're young, where if you were older in that situation, you might feel relieved with your secular parents, not imposing something on you, not making you feel responsible, guilty, kind of parentifying you, giving you some task where you have to be worried about other people's souls. But instead, it seems that you connected, which is very often the case with kids where they will connect with sort of the stronger presence, the one right? Who really instills fear, who has the rules and not having a sense about if it's healthy or not, but just that it seems to be the right way 
they then need to worry about other people. Uh, and it's same thing with, you know, when we talk about these, this idea of the parentified child, but also parental alienation, sometimes the, the more relaxed parent, the more easygoing user-friendly parent is the one who is looked down upon and the controller, the, the ones who have more of that structure and are more dictatorial or use more fear are the ones that the kids align with, which is very hard for the other parents who are trying to be reasonable and easygoing. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I would say was interesting, Rachel, as you're speaking, is I viewed my high control religious parents, if you will, as more kind. I viewed them as more caring about me. But as in retrospect, there was this sort of um, paradox of a tremendous amount of fear and control that was coming not only through through them, but through the systems that they were a part of that were very much about hell and wrath and the end of the world and those type of things. And so as a young kid, that made me quite anxious, very anxious, but it propelled me to dig further into the, the, the cultic system, if you will, because that was how in some ways I thought that my anxiety and my fear would go away if I plunged even more into it. And, and when that came to a head with my, my secular parents, then I perceived them as being the, the controlling ones and the dictatorial ones. Um, so it was just this very interesting shift or tension of power that now as an adult who is now 41 years old, I look back at and I say, whew, the, what you were experiencing in the religious groups were abuse. It doesn't matter how good it felt. It doesn't matter how emotional you got at times and, and that emotion leading you to, to think that that validated the, the religious group. All of that, I see now that there was, there was abuse that was happening there. It's a good piece of information for parents listening who feel that they've lost their children to you know, what they might perceive as the dark side, whatever that is because it doesn't mean that's going to necessarily be the way it is for life, but it can feel that way when you're young, that the ones controlling you are the ones who love you more. It's a fascinating thing. It happens a lot. Okay. So did you feel that you were supposed to report back about what was happening in that home? And, you know, if you saw the devil in your secular home or, you know, I don't know if you felt like you had to be a conduit of information back and forth. There was more of a suspicion that I carried with me in my secular home that stayed with me throughout my childhood. And so I would, you know, be learning through my, my mom and stepdad's influence, you know, I went to public schools and learning non-religious notions and things like that. And part of me was, I think, learning in healthy, critical ways, but the fear was so deep seated in me from my early childhood that I, I never really felt like I could trust what I was learning in public schools or could trust, you know, what I was learning in, in science class or what have you, because the truth, as I perceived it, was in six-day creationism, was in demonic activity, was in the impending rapture and the end of the world and the one world government and the Antichrist and false prophet and all of these things were just very present with me. And so from a young age, Rachel, I, I had some childlike um, imaginings, I guess. I would look at them now, but as a kid, I thought they were very real. And these are, I'm talking about supernatural things that I thought I saw as a kid. Um, and sometimes that was associated with my secular parents because it was an indication that there was a spiritual force that was happening in the secular area that validated what I was told about demonic activity happening in those secular spaces. Uh, okay. So it, it says so much about the power of the mind, the power of suggestion. I know if you walk into a home and you're planning to stay overnight and they welcome you warmly, then everything's fine. If you walk into a home, you're planning to spend the night and they say, oh, by the way, it's haunted, or we think it might be haunted. 
every noise you hear, every creaking floorboard, every everything, uh, the whistling sound of the heater or the air conditioning, it is all going to confirm what is on your mind and what you've been given, you know, the sort of the suggestion that's been fed to you. It's very interesting. So what did you imagine that you were seeing or hearing? Yeah. So one story came to my mind. Um, my dad converted to born again Pentecostal Christianity when I was around four, and he was immediately involved in demonology from the Christian perspective and um, uh, very much influenced by reading about near death experiences. And so I heard stories of people who claimed to visit heaven and hell, et cetera, et cetera, but also stories about angels and golden streets and, you know, those type of things. I'll start one with, with being at my dad's house. Um, you know, the religious parents, if you will. And at one time, interestingly, thinking that I saw a demon um, and I was five, um, I brought it up to my, my, my dad and I was validated. Wow, you have such keen insight into the spirit realm. You must have a call on your life. So from a very young age, I was told you have a call on your life because you can see these things. So I took that and I remember at one time being in my secular home and um, sitting there and um, thinking that I had seen a nine or 10 foot angel that was walking around the premises of the house. Um, and I didn't mention that, of course, to my secular parents, but I brought that back to my religious parents and said, I saw an angel. Right. And so then that was assigned meaning. And I can't quite recall what meaning that was assigned, but there was this validation again of um, me having this special insight. And again, as I think back on it now, I didn't literally see a demon or literally see an angel, but in my mind, it was very powerful as a child. And I believed it and I told it as if it was true. So fascinating. Right. And you probably could have described it in detail. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And also what's so interesting about those moments too, is that they're going to be given an interpretation by someone else that suits that person, uh, that helps to teach you something that they want to reinforce. For example, if, if you go to your secular parents and see an angel, then it probably would not be interpreted by your religious parents that that means that your secular parents are angelic, are fine, everything's godlike and safe. Instead, it was probably the angel that was protecting you. Bingo. And before you even said that, um, and I'm not a psychic mind reader, Rachel, but that's what was going through my mind as I started almost in my body remembering this sense of, oh my God, I'm, I'm protected. I have my guardian angels in the secular space that I needed to be protected. So I think about this so often when people bring something to somebody and it's amorphous and can't necessarily be proven, the other person, and it can also be dream interpretation. That's why I'm a little iffy about dream interpretation when people ask me about their dreams, even in therapy, because I'm thinking, you know, how am I a blank slate now in response to dream interpretation? Because there are therapists who will need for you to keep following a certain path of therapy or want you to feel like you need more. I mean, sort of the therapists who are not very responsible or professional. And so they'll interpret something else in the dream to fit their own needs. And so when I see even videos of people going to their shaman or their whomever, bringing something to them and saying, what does this mean? I hear in my head because of the work that I do, it's going to mean whatever that person needs for it to mean, <laughs> not what it means necessarily. And so it's very confusing. And I'm sure it's, it's nice now to be kind of in the land of the tangible, right? <laughs> so a little, a little more grounded, but still there is something that is a loss when people move away from that and not having the angels and the demons and the supernatural connection. And I know as much as it can play with your head, it's sometimes hard to, to forfeit that. So, okay. So moving from that, unless there was something else you wanted to say about that timeline or that time frame in your life. Well, I'll, I think an important thing to bring up is I, when I was at my, my religious parents' home, um, because they were in to the end of the world and seeing visions of the afterlife, I remember falling asleep listening to tapes about people who had claimed to go to hell 
and had claimed to interact with, with demons. And that was very scary to me as a kid, falling asleep, listening to those things. But then again, as I mentioned earlier, it propelled me further into them in some sense. Another, I think, important thing to mention was there was a book written called The Divine Revelation of Hell that I read. You know, it's a little beyond that time frame, but maybe 11 or 12. And the book talked about in very vivid graphic details what would happen in hell to people. And I particularly remember scenes in the book about uh, homosexuals and LGBTQ people who were chained together in a lake of fire in a river of fire. Um, and there was this this uh, picture painted through words of the agony. And there was another portion of the book that talked about somebody who was confused about their gender identity um, in this life. And so for eternity, uh, while being tormented by demons, they changed sex over and over and over again. And I read that book and as somebody who now recognize my experience on the LGBTQ spectrum, that was was terrifying for me um, and really cemented some pretty severe internalized homophobia. So I just wanted to, to mention that um, as, a, as something that influenced me, that um, I have had to do some some pretty serious work through to come to terms with the, the damage that is inflicted psychologically when you're exposed to that kind of stuff at a young age. Oh, it's so disturbing. And I'm so sorry that you had to go through that just listening to those stories before you go to bed. Okay. So there's that. Then the visuals, then knowing that this applies to you. Okay. And then I think what that sets up, like you're saying, is this internalized homophobia, but also maybe this idea that that you deserve to suffer or you're supposed to suffer. And your life is supposed to be an unhappy one. And and maybe that's a way to keep you safe or that you need to convert, quote unquote, right? Like that's a thing uh, to become something different. And it is, it's so the antithesis of this idea of God's love of all and, you know, the other religious teachings. It's it's hard to make sense of the dichotomy, the the conflict with so many of those teachings, you know, that God loves all, but only some of all. And so was that something that propelled you? You were saying that at 15, you converted to Mormonism. Did that have something to do with it? Yeah. So my father and stepmother, who were my religious parents, they were involved with a end times evangelist named Barry Smith, who in the 80s and 90s taught about the end of the world, um, the one world government, the incoming you know, rapture, and it was very tied into politics and that type of thing. And so they actually traveled around with him on this sort of end of the world campaign um, when I was in the early 90s. So um, I had a, a little bit of a respite, if you will, from the indoctrination um, for a couple of years. And um, so I remember in some ways those years were sort of, uh, as I look at it now, kind of like, whew, ah, some freedom to not think about these things, but it was still present in my psyche. Um, but I was also very fascinated by religion. And so even while religious parents were away, I'm still going and looking at books about religion and reading about religion. And somewhere along the lines, I met a LDS person and um, became friends with them. And right around my freshman year of high school, decided through my involvement with this particular friend who was Mormon and my dad and stepmom, religious parents, being away for a while. I really was compelled by some of the narratives I heard about Mormonism. It was very different to me than the hellfire and brimstone of my youth. You know, you go to a service and they're quiet and there are hymns playing rather than rambunctious music and tongues and all of that. And the prayers are very subdued and they use the and thy language and um, they're playing hymns on the piano. And so all of that was very different to me and very appealing to me um, in a sense. Right around that time, though, as I decided to convert to Mormonism, by the way, both religious and parents, secular parents, they all freaked out when I decided to join Mormonism because um, somehow, at least on the religious parent side, um, Mormonism was a cult, but what, what I was being indoctrinated in was not, right, which is a little bit ironic now. Um, but dad and stepmom moved back right around that time. 
Um, Dad made it very clear that because I was joining Mormonism, I would be bound for hell. But I stayed in Mormonism for a time, was involved with the community. There was not overt um, like homophobic teaching that I heard, but I was a researcher even from a young age thinking about things. And so I read books from Mormon history that you know, equated um, homosexuality with second to murder. Um, so there was not a friendliness about the Mormon teaching on um, LGBTQ issues at that time. It's gotten a little better, but still not great. Um, so what happened, though, Rachel, is that my evangelical or charismatic tribe, when they found out that I would converted to Mormonism, they started to send me, quote unquote, anti-Mormon material. Um, where I'm starting to learn about things that I had not been told when I decided to convert to Mormonism. Um, and so the story I had been given um, when I decided to convert wasn't what I started to see was accurate and as it pertains to some of the narratives of Mormon history. That caused me a, a, a sense of alarm and at a young age, a sense of disillusionment and lack of trust. Instead of, and I don't think I had the capacity at the time, but instead of taking that and being like, let me look at this whole thing that I'm a part of, it caused me to revert back to um, the Pentecostal charismatic groups. And I got very involved with my dad's Foursquare church at the time, which was being influenced by what was called the Toronto Blessing and the Pensacola Revival, which was a manifestation of the spirit, as they called it, where people are speaking in tongues and laughing in the spirit and rolling on the, the ground, singing in tongues and seeing visions and all these things. So I went, again, from Mormonism back to that in high school, largely precipitated by the anti-Mormon literature that had been given to me that uh, caused me to question. Wow. So here you were back. Did you then feel better, safer? Did you, what, what, what was the impact on you when you went back? People can Google the Toronto blessing and read about it, but this movement was infusing charismatic churches at the time. And so the worship and the preaching and what was happening in that religious environment um, was very uh, hypnotic. And I started experiencing things. I started thinking I was seeing visions again. I started paying attention to healing evangelists, like a guy named Benny Hinn, was, who was popular back in the day. When I was nine years old, I had gone to my first Benny Hinn meeting before he had popular crusades. Um, and had been slain in the spirit, you know, at one of his meetings and legitimately felt this hypnotic effect on me from a young age. But I come back to this scene as a high schooler, and it's, it's in, in, it has been amped up. Some of what I had experienced from a young age had started to collectively disseminate a, a, among several congregations and the congregation that I was in, the Foursquare Church. And so there were times where I got what they called drunk in the spirit, you know, where you're, you're, you're running into things in the church and laughing hysterically and getting into these uh, trance-like states. And all of that to me was validity that um, I made the right decision to leave Mormonism, to come back to the charismatic Pentecostal group. But I had not reconciled any of the things as it pertained to my sexual identity. And I ended up starting to listen to sermons of a preacher who I had been introduced to from a very young age. His name was Robert Flairden, um, who claimed to have seen, been taken on, on a vision of heaven. Um, and he was sort of a rising star in Pentecostal circles in the, the mid 80s and 90s. He was associated with the Word of Faith movement, Kenneth Hagan and Rama. I was reintroduced to him. I knew of him from a young age and listened to his tapes about heaven and yada yada and started listening to him again my junior and senior year. Um, he had started a Bible college and a church in Orange County, California, and I had decided that I was going to essentially go to his church and Bible college and pursue the high call of God. One more thing before you go. John is a really smart, really thoughtful person. And I'm so glad you got to hear from him today. He continues the conversation next week. He is someone who has been through quite a lot. And what's also interesting about his story is no matter how different it is, it's also very much the same 
the same as a lot of stories that I hear about. I have worked with a number of families, so many, as I mentioned even before I introduced John, that there is such a high percentage of divorce and separation and parental alienation when families are broken apart by a difference of belief or by a particular group shunning the other parent, causing the child to really be in the middle. And so what is unusual is you might not have that one set of parents is sure that the other set of parents are going to hell, but it does happen that in a lot of situations of divorce, the children are used. The children are used as go-betweens. The children are used as private investigators. The next time you're at your mom's house, tell me what she's up to. Tell me about her new boyfriend or her, her new husband, her partner. Tell me about what she's doing. Tell me basically about things that you shouldn't have to track and you shouldn't have to pay attention to and you shouldn't have to focus on who she's in bed with and what she believes and if she's still a believer. In these situations too, as John experienced, he was made to feel ultimately responsible for the other set of parents who were not believers. That it was really said to him that they were going to be going to hell and they were going to be possessed or they were possessed by the devil and that he, John, felt responsible for their souls. Imagine that for a moment that you are at the age where it's still hard for you sometimes to kind of walk and chew gum at the same time. It's a time where you should be able to have a feeling of abandon that you can just sort of kick a rock around the street just for no reason, just because you feel like it. And these are the times too when kids are sort of practicing their knock-knock jokes. They're usually not funny, but the fact that your kid thinks it's funny is the thing that makes it funny. But it should be lighter. Childhood should be lighter. And within cultic systems and also within relationships where there is a controller, a narcissist, very often there is this parental alienation where one parent really in a very competitive way wants to claim you for themselves and wants you to feel that the other parent really isn't qualified or really doesn't love you or is not safe to be with. It's a dangerous game. And I think it's a situation of thievery because children talk about how they feel like their other parents were stolen from them, were taken away because they weren't supposed to look up to them. They weren't supposed to feel safe with them. They weren't supposed to respect them. And some of them, as adults, have found their way back to that parent. It's usually the parent who is less domineering, the parent who is less kind of structural and strategic, the parent whose brain doesn't really work that way and they're just trying to be parents. They're the ones who the child is alienated from. The ones actually very often who would be the better and safer parent. And they're the ones who are pulled away from the child, they're the ones who go through the hurt, the loss, much more often than the controller. What you also have in this situation, though, is you have John not being able to just be a kid and not be able also to just deal with having a family going through divorce. That should be enough that you have to deal with two different places to live. And that you have to deal in some situations with having new adults introduced to your life as partners of your parents. Again, much more than a lot of children can handle. And when they can handle it, it's because the changes don't keep coming. There is a way to be introduced to that change in their life and then slowly introduce them to the person you're dating or the fact that you're going to be moving to another place with them. And so then on top of it, John didn't really get to have that moment or those moments 
I think, where he could say, what about me? What about what I need? Not what information do I need to be collecting? What data do I need to be collecting on this other parent to siphon it back, to feed it back to you? What do I need to worry about with that other parent? What kind of messages am I responsible to try to get across to that parent so that I can save their soul? That puts you in a situation where you are on a mission rather than the adults, to a great degree, being focused on you and being able to say, listen, we don't want to put that kind of pressure on you. That's not your responsibility if we believe in a different way than your other parent does. It really is something that you shouldn't have to think about. I wish that he had been given that space. I wish he had been given permission just to go out and play and not feel like he had to save and not be scared of going to the other parent's house because of what was going to be happening there. What's also true, and it's something that I highlight in my book about divorce, is that when you're setting up a household, if you can, if you're going through a divorce, where the child now has two different households, you try to keep things as similar as possible. Similar bedtime schedules, similar rules, similar environment, again, if possible. But his environments were so wildly different, so opposite, that when that happens, it actually takes a few days to adjust and readjust to the other household because it's so different. Because the way you behave and the way you talk and the things that are allowed are quite the opposite. And when you make an adjustment while you're there, you have to readjust when you come out of it. So I have this vision of John adjusting and readjusting and adjusting and <laughs> readjusting. And this is all the while that he's also trying to get to know himself and trying to understand his feelings and his attractions and being able to get that kind of moment, that quiet in your head that you need in order to just focus and understand. I just think of the cacophony of sound probably that was in his mind. So to all people out there who have had to go through divorce, whether it's something that was your decision or it was something that was your former partner's decision, or in a lot of cases I deal with, it was the organization's decision. Either way, your child's job is to just be your child. Your child's job is just to be their age and to go through their developmental stages and to go through their psychological stages. And at the end of the day, to not be asked, what did you find out? And to not be asked, what did you make sure to do and say to this other parent so that they would be safe or that they would snap out of their control and their indoctrination? But instead, you just want to be asked, how was your day? And for most kids, do you want another glass of water before you go to bed? Because that's usually a delay tactic for kids. Can I have another glass of water? And now can I have another glass of water? But whatever it is, you want the focus to be on the child and on what they need not on what they're supposed to do, and not on what they're supposed to do for you. I look forward to having John continue the conversation next week. Take good care. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.